Thank you all. So uh, I know probably one of my most famous lines is pinball is easy. Anyone still believe me on that one? What about y'all up here? OK. So pinball is easy. It's just everything that goes into pinball is complex and hard. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. First off, we thank you for uh, coming out and supporting uh, you know, Pinball Expo here um, in Illinois. And uh, I'm thankful to be um, uh, joined here by a lot of great people. Um, and uh, we hope to give you uh, little insights to what we're doing uh, in the same way that I have up till now, and that is not to, not to give too much away, but uh, I hope uh, leave with you a sense of passion that we have behind the scenes at Deep Root. Um, and, um, and with that, let's sort of get started. And the first thing I want to talk about is the people that aren't up here. Um, we have tens, uh, maybe even scores now, uh, we're hiring so fast of people behind the scenes working very hard. Um, they're all rock stars, and you will know very very soon uh, how much of rock stars they are in all the innovations that we have coming into the entire new Deep Root standard platform that we have for pinball. Um, you might know a couple of the people up here. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves. Um, but uh, I want to kind of introduce a couple of, uh, of people that are not up here. Uh, we have some uh, Deep Root people over here, uh, Sean, Craig, Daniel, Patrick. Uh, who run a lot of the, the leadership behind the scenes. Um, we have um, Stephen, our head tech, uh, back in Texas, leading all the technicians and getting all the prototypes and whitewoods done, getting the quad assembly or octo assembly, however you want to look at it, uh, all set up and going and ready for us to start manufacturing here very quickly. Um, and then we have our uh, creative studio in Utah run by uh, Nate and Johnny. And um, we have some of the most amazing talent, uh, people coming from... Uh, feature films um, coming from AAA video games. They're going to uh, blow your socks off with the quality of, of sort of the video and animation and audio uh, that we're going to be doing. We also have David Thiel. I don't know if, I don't know if David's in here or not. I didn't get to, ah, there he is. Thank you, David, for coming. Uh, and we also have a, another pinball audio artist uh, in, in the creative studio in Utah named Lance. And so we're very happy to have all these, these great and talented people. So with that said, let's uh, get to some quick introductions. Uh, and um, then we can get to some questions. Barry, why don't you start us off and we'll go down the line. Well, I'm Barry Ausler, and I spent 26 years at Williams working on games and a couple years at Highway working part-time, designing a few games, and then moved down to Texas in January to work for Deep Root, and I've got several games in the process right now. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> uh, my name is John uh, Papaduke. Uh, I started at Bally in the 80s, actually working with Dennis uh, Nordman. And then over at Williams, I was able to uh, work with um, a really talented group of designers and artists, programmers, management. So I uh, got through some games, uh, Circus uh, Voltaire, Theater of Magic, uh, World Cup Soccer, um, and continued on in pinball. And um, currently, I'm at Deep Root, um, uh, working on some uh, very cool secret uh, projects, some not so secret. And um, we continue again the next cycle of uh, pinball making. Uh, so I'm Quinn Johnson. Uh, so I am the, the in-house uh, writer. I work on design, uh, characters, voice lines, that kind of a thing. Basically, just trying to help the, the experience of, of these awesome games. Um, really be very interactive, very engaging for the player. I came from a background writing for uh, comic books. Started off writing for uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic book and then some others since then. Worked on uh, the Disney Infinity video game series and kind of did the story and level design with that. And now I get to work with a tons of incredibly, amazingly talented people and pinball legends and it's just, it's just crazy that I work in the same place and they bring in donuts sometimes and I'm like, this is... <laughs> These are famous people, and I get to eat their donuts. So that's cool. Uh, my name is John Norris, and I started in pinball in the 1970s as a player and enthusiast before there was even a hobby. I thought I was the only person in the whole world who loved pinball machines and, and started actually getting old games from the 1960s and tried, tried to learn how to become a really good player and then into the, into the early 80s was playing what little competitive pinball there was and uh, 
came to the first Pinball Expo and and questioned the panel discussion, and questioned the panel in a similar situation as this, how could, I, how could I get into pinball? And within a year, I was hired at Gottlieb as a junior designer and worked there for 10 years and designed many play fields and many more rule sets for the play fields, especially the, during the dot matrix era. And after Gottlieb Premier closed, I went over to Sega Pinball slash Stern Pinball. And now I have the honor of working for Deep Root Pinball. And I'm working on a, a project right now for Deep Root Pinball. And, and I just think what I've seen over there is really awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm Dennis Nordman, and I've been, been designing games on and off for the last 30 years, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and I've been laid off about from every company, too. But apparently, I'm not smart enough to get into another industry because I keep coming back to pinball. But it's, it's just a fun, it's a fun uh, project, a fun uh, theme, a thing to work on. I, I just enjoy all parts of it. And I'm really happy being here at Deep Root because I'm working on two original themes that I created. And with Quinn's help, it's been, they've been very well developed. And uh, I'm really excited for these games to come out. And Paul Ferris is going to be the artist on my game and some other games. But huh? um, I've never actually worked with Paul. I've worked mostly with John Yousey and Greg Ferris. So Paul's excited. We're, we're excited that we're working together finally. Uh, my name is Stephen Bowden, and I've been a pinball league and tournament player since 2004, I believe. Currently ranked top 12 or 13 in the world for in the IFPA. For those of you who care about that type of thing. Um, and my uh, involvement with League and Tournament Play has really gotten me um, enthusiastic about rule sets and how they interact with each other and as far as multiple layers for the beginner, the intermediate, and the advanced and tournament player, just like those tournament players who are fighting it out down the hall right now to try to qualify. Um, so, and uh, yeah, the, what's, what's, what's been going on here? Just it's got this Jersey boy to move down to San Antonio, so. It's, and it's my honor to be up, to be up on this stage with you, with you, with you gentlemen. And uh, just the thing, last year I was sitting right where you are, and now I've crossed the Rubicon. So, uh, and it's the best decision I've ever made, I think. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank each one of you. Uh, great introductions. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, just to kind of round things out. Um, I have no place here, really. Uh, I grew up loving video games and not pinball. Um, I have nothing to do with pinball, nothing to do with manufacturing. I just, uh, after having a successful you know, legal career, I uh, decided to unleash myself and created a family of companies now um, with, with a lot of blessings along the way uh, where I can do some things that I'm passionate about. I, I've talked before on a podcast a little bit about how I got passionate about pinball a couple years ago. And it was really uh, from 3D Space Cadet, uh, which came with Windows 95. And then that kind of moved into, I wonder how much a pinball machine costs. And uh, a month later, I was buying uh, a massive, uh, very well um, restored collection of, of about 15 Williams Valley games. And I had a Jersey Jack in there and a one Stern in there as well. So uh, then I got connected with, uh, with Jack and Charlie uh, and Dennis and... Uh, Greg Ferris and we all were talking about what we were going to do and things just didn't work out at the time uh, and we kind of came back uh, I started building a team in 2016 into 2016 and we had just have been picking up the most amazing talent uh, mostly outside of pinball but also in pinball since and uh, I, uh, I can't wait to show you what we're doing but uh, unfortunately um, we're going to uh, to need a little bit longer to get things the way that we want them and um, uh, we will be on time. I know there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, TPF, uh, Ed is here. Thank you very much for allowing us to, um, to uh, come out at TPF uh, next March, and we have a lot of uh, very cool things to show you. Uh, so what we're going to do today or tonight is talk a little bit about our methodology and our process more than I've um, talked about publicly up till now. And I want to go through each of the, the panelists here and kind of get their, their idea 
uh, about some of the things we've been doing, and then we'll turn it over to question it, uh, questions, uh, which hopefully we'll have some good answers for. So um, I want to start with Quinn first, because uh, Quinn came in, um, and uh, one of the main things that we want to do at DeepRoot uh, that's different from any, uh, everywhere else is we actually want to create uh, IP, we want to create narratives, we want to create stories that drive the pinball versus slapping a license on there that everyone kind of knows sort of what's going on. Uh, and, and that's really uh, driven a lot of our projects uh, up to date. So Quinn, why don't you talk about coming real quick from the comic book world and your transition to pinball. What was the first 30 days like? And then um, a little bit about what you do day to day. Okay. So. Um yeah, so one of the, the things that fascinates me about storytelling in general is that you can, is that people can get so drawn into an experience. Um, and really, that's, that's what I love about, you know, that's what I loved about comic books, video games, and now pinball, is, is really being able to not only make it just fun, but make it something that you get really involved in. You're like, okay, so there's actually like a storyline going through this thing, and I want to do what it takes to reveal the next big cool thing, and... Um, which is an exciting challenge with pinball because like with with movies and and you know books and stuff like that you have tons of room typically to really lay it all out um, but with pinball you know it's there's your your it's just a very unique medium and so you're like okay so what can we do with this unique medium and still tell a story that's gonna be really cool and so it's been really exciting uh, for it, it was actually funny because when I first saw the job posting that they were looking for a, a narrative designer, um, I was like, oh, story for pinball. That sounds interesting, and I'll just apply and see what happens. And so, uh, and so then it came to me, <laughs> it ended up all working out really well, and, and then so I got put in the awesome position where they're like, figure it out and make it something really cool. So it was very cool because I, because I came from, I, th I feel like because I came from kind of the more video game comic book world and not the pinball world, I, I didn't know what the limitations should be. And so I was able to just work with everybody and come up with some, just really let my imagination go wild. And, and you know, we all collaborated and came up with some really awesome ideas. Um, and so I think the stuff that we're putting together is stuff that no one's, no one's ever really, is for, from what I'm finding out, the more and more I, I get into it and the more and more I'm learning all the time, um, it's kind of stuff that people have never seen before with, with pinball. And so it's going to be super exciting. So, so the first 30 days, I guess, were just lots of just brainstorming and writing and, and just working with everybody to come up with some super cool stuff. And it's been exciting to see at the stage we're at now where it's like, wow, this stuff is, it's, it's happening. <laughs> this stuff is like really happening in a physical form. And, and we're so excited to share it with everybody else. And, and anyway, show everybody what we've been working on all this time. So. Hello? Oh, there it is. Good. Uh, thank you, Quinn. Um, I think narrative driving pinball instead of the pinball driving the narrative is, is exactly the way we want to go. And uh, especially with a creative studio in Utah with a lot of people who have done a lot of uh, um, uh, film work uh, and other IP work, uh, it's going to allow us to do a lot more uh, with pinball to get pinball out there and, and tell uh, the world about the story. And pinball is a nice way to... to to bridge that gap and transition it uh, to bring more people into pinball. So I think it's going to be really fun. Um, one of the phrases or slogans we've used, we've used a couple, uh, like every family needs a pinball, every pinball needs a family. Um, one of the other ones we've been using is pinball for the masses. And what I want to do real quick is I want to ask Barry, John, uh, John and, and Dennis um, what they think and the designs they've been doing without giving too much away, of course. Uh, how pinball for the masses applies to their philosophy of of making you know great themes and layouts. So we'll start with you, Barry. What what is um, what does pinball for the masses mean to you when you're when you're designing games? Hello, I'm trying to design different themes, something that appeals to everybody. Like I did in the past, I do a, car a carnival game, or I do you know a sci-fi game, or you know a monster game like Dracula. And I'm trying to keep the same thing going here. I'm working on you know several different projects, and every one of them's different. I mean, there's n nothing that connects any of them together as far as themes. So I mean, it's something that would appeal to everybody, to the masses, I guess. <clears throat> oh, that's a loaded question. Um, 
So those of us that started in pinball, uh, the, the games were designed to earn money, to the coin drop, coin box. So if you could have a chipmunk you know, running around on the play field and it would earn 500 a week, then um, uh, you know, our managers would be very happy. And things started to change, and today it's kind of flipped over. So we have more of a collector audience, more husbands and wives, more families. Um, so back then, the mass was designing for, and I'm, I call my, and these guys always hear it all the time, I'm kind of like a middle of the road designer, so I, I don't have all the high end, or I won't put in, a, you know, initially all the high end rules and, and super combos and all, you know, those types of things. Um, and I'll, I'll come up with a vehicle, or on the team, we'll come up with a vehicle, something to, to get the game started. The player understands after playing a game or two what they're supposed to do. So. So, and, and, I, and I think that's a Nintendo philosophy. Um, if you read any of the work from Miyamoto, like they'll talk about the use of colors and design shapes, characters, um, and kind of go that way. So, so for me, the, the mass uh, hasn't changed as much. I'm still, I feel like I'm designing for the same type of player. I think what's different is that the, uh, the people that are bringing the games into their home, they're, they're requiring or they're demanding a different level of something in the game. So it might be play-filled artwork, it might be an extra mechanism, it might be something hidden underneath a play-filled plastic, it might be a really uh, interesting ramp design they haven't seen before. Um, so I find in the games that we're building now, um, uh, you know, they're not so much overly complex, but they have a certain level of sophistication or complexity in them um, because I believe now the mass kind of requires that from the designers and the story and, and programming and artwork and manufacture, just like a little extra something in it um, um, to make it, um, you know, that they would want to buy, but then enjoy it once you get it home. You know, uh, everybody's bought a pinball game, you're bringing it home after a month or two, it's like, mm, who could we sell this game to? And, and so I like to do it the other way is, uh, if I can, is, you know, once you get the game home, you don't want to sell it. You want people wanting it to, to be bought from you. So, so, so I think in the work I do, and I drive everybody crazy um, with details and, and drawing extra things and making sure, you know, mechanisms or brackets are, are, are working or we have some new device um, and kind of go from there. So, so I think in many cases, as a designer from my standpoint, uh, obviously, I like doing original themes because we have more control. Um, we can do more with it. Um, we can pretty well, you know, create all the characters. There's a lovely um, uh, poster in the Pinball Expo book, which I just saw today. And yeah, so and I mean, I was like, wow. So I know the characters, but I mean, it was like, ooh, okay. So it was like, hmm. So kind of like that. That's where the sophistication, the complexity is. Is that there's a whole story just behind that poster. And you know, people may just flip the book and not really think of it, but you know, we talk about it all day long, the, the characters, and, and, and you know, they kind of start to live, like they become real, where you're like, wow, the character doesn't do that. Well, yeah, she does, no, she doesn't. So it becomes a little bit ridiculous, and I think that's the passion for pinball. And again, I learned that at Bally, you know, we were very passionate, um, but when we got to Williams, you know, they were in the 90s, um, you know, the people there, and so Barry was there, you know, Larry DeMar was there, Steve Ritchie, um, a lot of people were there that had made these incredible games and they taught us to kind of have that passion and think about the mass, think about the person you're designing for and it was very hard for them because when you get there you don't know anything and they're trying to explain it to you, you do this and that and you're always battling on stuff. But now when you look back, you're like, you know, these people were really genius people and they did their best to kind of impart with you that special knowledge that you can make these games now to appeal to a wide variety of player, or in this case, it's now home player, it's family, it's collector, it's much different. So, um, so I think, um, in, in, you know, from my viewpoint, it's kind of gotten harder, and then we're trying to simplify it in that the games have, you know, you only have so much time to develop it that you have to get to manufacture. So part of the problem is you can't work on a game for four years and not finish it, you have to finish it in a reasonable amount of time, cut it off, move forward, take all that, those extra ideas and you know, put them on the next game and the next game and kind of keep it going. Because people don't want to wait like five years for a game. It's just, you know, it's just, it, it needs to be done in, in a more finite thing. So, so, so for me, I find it really exciting and very challenging. And, and I, you know, I've uh, so many new game ideas, meaning to, to bring forth, bring within the team. We're teaching a lot of new people, never done pinball before, like Robert said. 
So kind of the way that I was taught, and I, the term I use is hands like wood. You come in and you have hands like wood. You can't do anything. You're kind of hopeless case. So, so, but those people had the patience and the time to help me and to mentor me. So, so I, you know, I do my best to mentor and kind of move it along that way without annoying people too much, but to kind of say, you know, let's think about this, let's try this, and, and this may not work, but let's do it anyway, and, and, and you know, kind of have the same type of learning and, and um, open road that, that we had, um, you know, when I was kind of uh, learning bimbo. So, so for the masses, yeah, I think it's a, it's a real, it's a, it's easy in one regard, but then it's also it's very complex. Uh, it's, it's, it's very passionate. There's a lot of heart and soul that goes into the games. Everything that you do, you really feel it. Oh, oh you know, they move the post over. Or they they want to rename something, and it's like, oh, why are they doing that? But, you know, you just have to kind of let it go. Because everybody has the same passion on your team, which you forget. You know, you're not the only passionate person. It starts from the, the top of the company all the way through. Everybody has the same passion, and but everybody has kind of a certain role to play. So you have to make sure you're you're being, you know, positive and helpful and all of those and what you do well, and then let the other people um, do what they do well. And um, yeah, so it's very exciting. And, and um, you know, I think um, uh, hopefully people will be very happy once they start to see uh, what we're doing and the new design and, and um, a lot of new technology and things coming forth that's never been done in pinball before. So it'll be uh, pretty interesting uh, uh, moving forward. Thank you, John. Okay, um, designing for the masses. Well, that's an interesting one. Well, let's go back to back when I was at Gottlieb and as J-Pop was saying about the, the coin op days and you cared about, cared about revenue, but what I would do is I would go, we, we, you, we used to place games out on test for the weekend in a bowling alley called Gala Lanes and Carroll Stream. And I would go in there like on a Friday night dressed in jeans and a t-shirt with our game on test, watch you know, not play the game, but get kind of where I could watch the game and watch the player come up and obviously play it for the first time they've ever played it. You know, they'll put, you know, probably enough money in it for maybe two or three plays. And then when they're, when, you're, when it looks like they're totally done, you, I would walk up to them pretending like they're the expert. Oh, what, what, what are you supposed to do? What, what's the object of the game? I wanted to make sure that, that they got the main object of the game without, and obviously they didn't read the instruction card because no one ever reads the instruction card until they're totally perplexed. And then they try to decipher three or four paragraphs which really don't tell you much. My mission was to make sure that they got it. The, how to get to the, multi, the main multi-ball, the main object of the game, that they, that they got it. Well, now, now the customer, and that's still true today, because people who walk up to the game, even as beginner players, you still have to be able to get it with, the game has to tell you in a way, navigate you as a player how to get it. But the, the challenge with, for the masses today is because so many games are going into the home, put on free play, that the game has to it's really important now that the game appeals to all skill levels of players because the Gottlieb philosophy of back in the 90s was just for the casual player. and We don't care about the 1% tournament level players because they're not the ones putting the most money into the game, just average casual players. Well, today it's important that we design a game that will appeal in the game. rule set, play field shots, entertainment value for anybody who is from that seven-year-old kid who's who's hitting both flippers at the same time playing their first game, all the, all the way up to a Steve level tournament player and every other pinball collector who may not be a great, really great player. They, they may collect pinball because they love the art or love the interaction of the play field toys or whatever. That is what our mission is, to design for everybody. Um, pinball for the masses, that's, that was a new one to me because 
I'm not down there at Deep Root every day. I work here in Chicago. So when I design a game, I design a game to please me. Because if it pleases me and I'm passionate about it, then a lot of other people are going to love it too. If, if I'm not happy working on a theme or it, it doesn't please me or challenge me to work on it, then probably not many people are going to like it either. So, so the name of my first game, oh, I can't tell you that. Um, but my second game is, no, nah, I can't tell you that either. Would anybody like to see Whitewater 2? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so, um, so for my first, my first game, this is the first experience. Now, Greg and I used to work a lot on storyline and, and rules when we worked together. And I've never actually had anybody like Quinn to work with. So I had uh, a basic idea of what I wanted my first game to be. And Quinn and I worked together and really fleshed out the theme. And it's going to be something that you can understand when you walk up to the game. It's going to make sense and it's going to be fun. And um, I've built a couple of models of, of devices that are going to be in the game and in the artwork. So that really helped uh, Paul Ferris see my vision for what I wanted on the back glass. And um, that's it. Yeah, I, want, I wanted to uh, jump on that question as well of the concept of uh, Pimp Off of the Masses was an important word in that is the concept of layering. Um, those of you who may not know a lot about me, I, in, in a former life I used to be a, a high school teacher in a public school district in the inner city. And those of you who are in the education business are aware of the term called scaffolding, wherein you use a previous idea to build on the next idea for your students and you use that idea to build on another idea. And by the time you get to the end of the semester, they've learned all of these things. So in the sense that builds a sense of layering so that you can, you can have a spot for the new player to jump on, ride your story to the end so that they become more of a veteran player and also have the depth so that the veteran and the pro player like, like myself will be able to Want, want to show the effort to work through the entire story. So in that way, providing multiple junction points to get onto the story so that all types of players will jump on, stay motivated, buy, purchase, put more money in, and, and so forth. So that's how, that's how I'm seeing it. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate that. I was actually going to follow up the next question for you. Um, there's a lot of very good programmers and rule set designers that uh, have graced pinball over the decades. Um, and I can only imagine how daunting it was for you to come outside of pinball in many ways, pinball design, uh, and come into uh, a unique environment uh, with a lot of, um, a lot of questions uh, until you came down uh, and saw what we were doing, and to just jumping on roll sets. And I, I, can, I, I think I posted it on pin side, and I'll state it here, is that I don't think uh, the pinball world's ever seen uh, a roll set designer yet uh, at the level that Steve has come in and just pounded things out. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that, that you took a plunge and came down to Texas and, and joined the team and, and the interaction. And I guess what's one of the big things that a lot of uh, the panel members have talked about is, is really Deep Root is about collaboration. We don't want people going off and, and locking themselves up and having secrets internally. Uh, it's every day, it's just a constant collaboration between a lot of different people, even with Dennis and John. Uh, and, and, and John as well, not, uh, not being there um, all the time, there's still a lot of collaboration back and forth about it. So in and, and coming in, uh, Steve, then, and, and, and working on rule sets um, and, uh, and kind of having a wide open territory, what philosophies did you kind of come to terms with immediately um, about how you were going to start that very daunting task? So. Oh, yeah. Testing, yeah. Well, when I came in, I, I knew it. I had to hit the ground running. I mean, especially the, you know, when, when I was anticipating my arrival at, at Deep Root. And then when I came in, and maybe I can talk about my first 30 days, that's, that's essentially what it's been. Um, you know, coming in and, and, and seeing the, the, the creative team I was joining and, you know, having a look at what, at, uh, at what Quinn had produced, and, uh, which has been totally awesome. I mean, <laughs> what you've done. And using that and essentially making sure what Quinn has produced works in a pinball way. Okay, and so that's basically as far as I'll go with that. So the, um, those of you I know kind of understand what that means. I mean, there's certain things that uh, you can do that, but you have to boil it down to can this work on a physical environment 
and then it still go through the story as that we want to do. <laughs> okay, so that that in that way, you know, trying to make sure that I formulate the plan to also follow what we want and also make it work so that it will work and make sense as you play the game because at the end of the day, the, the player has control of the ball, so they have control of the story, really. So <laughs> it's their dollar, all right, or it's their whatever they spent for the game. So at, at that point, it's their story at the end. So that's that's really it. Is it okay if I jump in real quick and just comment? Yes, on but I'm, I'm going to tell a quick story about yeah. that before I forget, then I'll have you jump in, Quinn. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so I'm not the best pinball player, and I think a lot of us at Deep Root uh, are very um, – we're very embarrassed uh, that when Steve came in, all the high scores were suddenly all gone. Uh, in fact, I haven't invited Steve over to my house yet to play in my pinball machines uh, just because I don't want all my high scores gone. And uh, there'll probably be nothing to you. But so anyway, one of the first things that, that Steve taught me in, in how to become a better pinball player was uh, it's your ball, uh, don't waste it, right? And so holding on to flippers and patience and stuff. And uh, it, it's a perfect corollary to... Uh, the type of rule sets and, and narratives we're working on is to allow the user finally to be able to get into that immersive world under glass, as it's been often called, uh, and to be, become a part of the, the narrative and story as well. And we're doing some really cool mechanical and electrical things as well as some rule set and uh, audiovisual things to, to immerse the player even more. Quinn. I was going to say, it's just really, really cool. I mean, it's, it's awesome working with everybody, but, but I share an office with Steve and we're talking like every day and I'm just like, I love working with this guy because he's just so cool and so friendly. And I love how he's like, like he said, he's taking all, this, all these ideas that I've been working on for all this time and then he's taking them and saying, and now we're gonna translate that into all the details of like this, 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 this. And it's so funny because he, he totally has this, surprised that your brain isn't like five times bigger than it is because you have so much pinball knowledge in there and he's like and he's like oh then we could totally do this and this which reminds me of this other thing and this and this and this and then the math could and I'm just like I believe everything you're saying I don't understand but I believe that it will be awesome um, and so it's just really really cool another thing that I've learned from <laughs> Steve about playing pinball because again this is something that I was starting to get new into I was always raised with the idea that you don't shake babies and you don't shake old people, but I'm learning that it's okay to shake pinball machines and that's actually how you win if you can shake it skillfully. And, uh, and he's amazing. I actually wish that there was a tournament for people that could drain the fastest because then I would be the champion and not this guy, so. Win. Um, I think that goes to show that you don't have to be a really good pinball player to be a good designer because I've seen what y'all have done behind the scenes. Uh, and I uh, can't wait to, to show the rest of y'all. Um, real quick, uh, we're going to kind of go through one more uh, kind of big question, and for everyone, I'll let everyone give a sort of a brief answer, and then we'll get to questions. Um, and uh, so what I want to ask uh, each one of you, basically, um, how are you designing pinball differently um, so for, for the, we'll go through the four designers first. How are you designing pinball differently now at Deep Root than you did uh, prior with other companies? And you might list one or two just, just brief things that, that are different in, in your philosophy and in, in actually designing it. And then I have another question for, for Quinn and Steve. Barry, you want to go ahead and start that? How has Deep Root, uh, let, me, let me do a little bit on clear. How has Deep Root changed the way that you design uh, for, for pinball? I don't get to stay home for snow days anymore. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the design is pretty much the same concept as it's always been, just that we can do more now with all the animation, the video screens on the back, and just the technology. But the basic concept, I'm, I'm still doing it the same way. I start drawing on a drafting table, and then I transfer it into a computer because I like to look at the full-size game on a drafting table first just to get all the main shots down. I mean, that's, that's my way. Um, just on Robert's comment that he thought he's not a good player, actually, Robert, um, he's like my secret tester. I have a few people at Deep Root that I'll call in, and I'll just watch them play, and I won't say anything, because if, um, if Robert feels he's not a good player, which I don't agree, but he can make some of the shots and, and have some fun and make some loops and this and that, then that's a good sign for, again, for that average type of a play field design. Um, designing different for Deep Root. Um, 
I think two things have happened. One, um, uh, when I was at Williams, I had a, a, an engineer, Jack Scalen, that used to engineer all my games. So he passed away uh, re relatively recently. So um, currently, I, I design and engineer all the games. And uh, what I'm doing now differently is that as I'm working, I'm thinking about how can this be teachable, meaning uh, how mechanisms are put together, how they're assembled. Um, to pass that along, and also uh, uh, bill of material costs. How much is this going to cost? So obviously every pinball designer or every design team wants to glob it up with, you know, let's have 16 motors and 12 magnets and all this type of things. But when you get to bill of material time and actually cost the game out, you're going to be way over. So part of it is that as we work on the game, we always have discussions. Well, um, so on the on one game we're doing, uh, Quinn wanted a, like a magnetic diverter. We didn't have one on this one ramp that split into three ramps. And um, so we talked about it. And so we, we didn't do something else so we could get that coil, get it up there. We came up with a new type of a diverter system that kind of hasn't been done. Um, uh, but again, it's, uh, it's the, the give and take that we know when it, when it comes at the end, we're going we're gonna to have to go through costs of everything and we have to kind of determine, well, what is the feature? How much is it going to cost? Can we keep it in? How easy it is to assemble? Because we're teaching new people to assemble pinball games, new technicians, all of that. So, so, so when I'm just laying something out, I'm actually thinking a little bit farther down the road. Um, how can someone assemble this quickly? How can it cost not too much, but then how can it look super cool or function in a really, really you know, awesome way on the play field to the player? So they're not going to notice all that thought that goes in underneath but actually a lot of thought does go in and underneath, so when you have kind of a new mechanism on the game, um, it's actually, you know, it's, it's the right mechanism, it's there for a reason, it's, it's really been thought about, everybody kind of agrees it works, and we kind of move that way. So, so definitely designing a deep root, it's just not, well, here it is, and just kind of make it. Um, there's actually more thought that goes in, and then it's actually been easier for me because I share room with Barry, so I just copy everything he does, and then I put it on my game, so it saves me time. <laughs> The biggest difference for me is is the support team that Deep Root is giving. When I was at Gottlieb, we had like the artists would determine the story and, and, and do all that, but since they were already busy doing the art, they didn't have time to devote to doing things such as developing a story or even using dot matrix display to to display it. And then also the time to do a game. And I was at Gottlieb, we typically have three or four months to do a game from beginning to end. And I've had that much time just to tweak shots on my play field. So, but you know, the whole way that Deep Root approaching this with Quinn and now Steve being able to shoot the game and, and help balance and tweak the rules and make suggestions on the rules that no, this this really sucks, whatever. Well, that's something I, I, I never ever had, be, we never had before. You know, when you have a, a, a whole engineering department of, a, of 12 to 15 people, you're just trying to get games to the assembly line, you know, about 20 years ago. This, this day, with, in this day and age now with Deep Root, in all of the support personnel that Deep Root is giving us, tools, talented people, that makes a huge difference. Um, the biggest difference for me is that I work from home now, which is can be both good and bad because when I worked in the office, you can concentrate all day long with nobody bothering you. And when I'm at home, my wife, I'm in the basement working trying to figure out a problem, something isn't going to fit, and it's driving me crazy, and I hear, Dennis, Dennis, what? Can you come up here a minute? So I have to deal with that all day. So then I come upstairs, can you get the cat off the roof? <laughs> Stuff like that. So, but the other thing is, is that Robert's letting us um, do whatever we want in our games up to a point. He hasn't told me yet I can't put something in. So, I mean, my first game was really loaded with cool stuff. I don't know how much might come out of it in the future, but right now it's pretty interesting. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, and then sort of the same but a little different uh, take uh, for Quinn and Steve. We'll start with Quinn first. Um, 
So I originally, and there's been a lot of confusion on this. Originally, I wanted uh, the name of this seminar to be "Last Words with Deep Root Pinball" as sort of a play on some things that I said prior. And for some reason, without uh, being, uh, without me being involved, it turned into Future Worlds, and then recently it turned into Last Words again. So uh, I'm going to kind of take that and use that and ask, um, what do you think? Um, what does Future Worlds um, with what we're doing behind the scenes? Um, what does that mean to you uh, as, as you're going into the narrative and then the rule sets? How does that drive your, your passion and your direction for, for creating this? Um, I would say that one of the awesomest things about working with Deeper is that we are breaking a lot of molds and we're shifting a lot of paradigms. And so it's opening up whole, I mean, the way I look at it, it's opening up a whole new era, I guess you could say. I know that sounds super dramatic, but I mean, it's bringing, opening up a whole new era of what pinball now can become. Um, a lot of the limitations are, are being taken away, and, and so it opens up so many new avenues for, for these pinball games to be these really amazing, awesome experiences that were never possible before. So for someone like me who wants to try to make it as big as possible, it, it, uh, it, it's really liberating and really super cool, so. Talking about uh, future worlds, I mean, in a sense, that Deep Root pinball, pinball is my future world now, I mean, so uh, in a sense what I've been doing is, you know, using my rules enthusiasm that I've built up over the years, and in a sense, yes, this is my first rules design job in the industry, but being that, you know, I've been a fan of Many of these gentlemen's games for years, you know, and, and inhaling, you know, what, what are the best, most efficient ways to play their games and also how they break down to the different level of players and how they were able to do that with each game. And then also taking that idea and bringing that into our new concepts, which we're looking to put out uh, very soon. So uh, get ready. That's all I'll say. I like that. Get ready. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that from you. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, we'll take some questions now and we'll see. Um, um, just one thing, Robert. Um, did you want to um, discuss a little bit about uh, the facility, what we're setting up, the size, the or leave it for future? Because it's pretty cool, like the gig that we got going, and people kind of don't have any idea. Um, I'm going to assume most people kind of have read This Week in Pinball, um, have listened to some of the podcasts at least, and kind of know some of that. Um, but uh, thanks for trying to get me to disclose some things uh, we're not ready to disclose yet. Um, what, what I will say is this, is what, what is Deep Root's schedule, right? Um, I think that's a little bit more important. So we're working hard behind the scenes. Um, we're really behind on some things, and we're really ahead on others. Uh, it's sort of like a horse race. Uh, and, but we have this, this huge focal point, this, I don't call it a deadline, but it's, it's a day of excitement for us um, coming at uh, TPF in March. Um, and uh, we're going to have some amazing things. So uh, while I don't want to steal the thunder from, from uh, Rob's uh, uh, Pinball Expo here, uh, we really hope to see all of you in, in Texas in March because uh, we want you to, to see everything we've been working so hard on. Um, in fact, uh, Sean, our, our uh, VP of Operations, uh, has put up a deadline clock now in uh, the E area, which is our break area, uh, which is counting down uh, by second or by minute. I don't know which. Yes, there you go, uh, when we need to have things done. So uh, we're going to do it, uh, and we're going to do it right the first time. And with that, let's take some questions. Daniel, if you want to, we don't have wireless, but I think we have a microphone that at least reach a little bit, so. And if you can't reach the microphone, just shout it out, and I'll, I'll repeat, and we'll direct it to whoever needs. This is probably for the designers. Uh, so we've heard a lot of talk just now about more of the cerebral side of pinball, but you have all worked with some great mechanics people in the past. Can you talk a little bit about uh, where you might break new ground in mechanics or some great mechanical people you have on the team right now? I'll answer that one. If anyone wants to pop in, you can pop in. But uh, 
Um, I, think, I think it's been very clear that we're focusing more on the Williams Valley type of standard, but going our own direction with that. Um, I think each one of the designers has put a lot of effort without any thought to cost um, or complexity into uh, a lot of different um, a lot of different mechs. I know the famous one for uh, for John Papaduke is you know uh, shipping out magic girls without the ball floating in midair, and it might seem like an easy thing to do, but it's never been done before in pinball because it's almost impossible to do. Trust us until Deep Root got their hands on it. And uh, I'm very, very happy to say that we have a, a very good solution to that. And uh, it's really good, but it's no different than each one of the other designers. Uh, I think each one of the games now has something never done before in pinball. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with the designers coming up with these crazy ideas. And then our mechanical engineers going out and, uh, and actually making it reality. So. All right, they're going to play it safe, so we'll go to the next question. Thank you. Robert, I've heard you talk about quad process and oct process. Could you tell us exactly what you mean by those terms? Y yes and no. Um, first, um, they're cool terms, uh, but they do have uh, realistic meaning behind the scenes, and they have to do with how to um, get the maximum efficiency in the smallest amount of space. Um, and uh, we currently have a, a great consultant uh, uh, doing the documentation for, for those processes, and we're very excited to get them marked out on the floor and start, uh, start testing them out. And uh, this is right about the time that we need to be doing it if we want to have games ready to, to, to ship um, by our deadline next year. Um, it has not only, just to give you a little tidbit, uh, has uh, not just something to do with the number of people working, but it has to do with the actual process for how uh, the cabinet play field assembly are actually put together. Um, and we have a lot of very unique things in our, in our package, and uh, um, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Hey, Dan, I'll, I'll just let you pick. Tiered pricing or single price? So the question was whether we were going to have tiered price or single price uh, tiered such as like Stern. Um, I guess the positive way to spin it is I don't believe in selling the same product for a much higher price um, and just slapping different artwork on it. So we will be going with one tiered model, one tiered price. And I will say, um, I'll add to that about prices. Uh, we would love to get prices lower than any pinball company has ever done, but with more quality and uh, toys in it than any pinball company has ever done. But we also have some, some higher end games planned as well. So uh, we're going to have quite a range uh, that should fit any budget uh, on any theme. My question is for Quinn. Uh, so you've done comic books and so forth. So my question is now you've actually probably seen some artwork from Paul Ferris on your work. So can you comment, not telling us anything about it, but what do you think of Paul Ferris and his artwork and what do you think about it? Really, really good. <laughs> He's awesome. Actually, it was really cool. So when I met Paul, um, it was when uh, Dennis and Paul and I were talking about Dennis's new game and I mean, it, we, it was just awesome. Like, the creativity was just exploding. And, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, and then meeting this guy that's like a legendary artist that's been doing some of these crazy famous games with just incredible artwork is just just super, super cool. And I love art. I, I'm an artist as well, but so I appreciate art, even though these guys are way better than anything I could ever do. And uh, it's just really thrilling, really cool. I know that uh, you're trying to reach the deadline of uh, TPF, but um, are you going to have game multiple titles available for sale by your deadline date of June 30th? Yes, we will release more titles in 2019 than any pinball company in history. In fact, we'll also release more than most of the entire industry released in, in one year, uh, given any given year, so um, stay tuned. If you're willing to divulge are any of your titles based off of Zidware's designs, the games that were supposed to be provided by Zidware? So 
I will say that, um, that there have been a lot of hints here. Uh, I know everyone probably did some subtle ones, but we, we, uh, we actually gave a lot of hints to some of the games we're going to be doing already. Um, and I would uh, direct you to uh, Jeff Patterson's This Week in Pinball. He has a list of some of the ones that have been announced and confirmed, and we'll sort of leave it with, with that right now. So this is more of a business-related question, so I guess it will be primarily to you, Robert. Um, but I'm, it could be also relevant to the designers in the sense of diversifying what Deep Root does. Um, I'm wondering, you know, in order to make the business profitable, you've had your hand in a bunch of things in the past. Is Deep Root Pinball, under its label, diversifying in any way? Because we've seen pinball designers traditionally doing slot machines and other things. Um, are your programmers going to diversify in video games and stuff? And I think one more tidbit of a question. Do you think that in the long term, um, a pinball company can be successful as a publicly traded company? Um, I'll answer the last one first. Uh, no. Um, pinball company will probably never be successful um, as a publicly traded company because of the regulations that go into and the amount of disclosure that goes into um, filing. Um, uh, to answer your other question, um, I'll, I'll just leave it at this, is that um, I'm not worried whether something is very profitable or not on a, on a per title basis. Um, the way we've designed everything internally is that any pinball machine sold will be profitable uh, internally. And that gives us uh, a lot of um, room to deal with not worrying about bomb costs and, and things like that, and to, but still to give the best bang for the buck uh, for y'all who are going to be spending a lot of money on these games and you deserve to get the most value possible for every dollar you put into it. Uh, it's a very different concept, um, and I think uh, very shortly you're going to start seeing uh, why. It's not going to be whether or not, you know, um, it's Deep Root or something else. It's like... Uh, it's more going to be more of a question of why would I not buy a deep root machine with the value in it, uh, even if I happen to like the la latest you know theme or license from another company. And so we want to make that value argument uh, to teach and everyone you and, and everyone else in pinball. Oh, just to add, uh, I worry about bomb cost always. Um, but at Williams, you know, we were taught just to get back to the the value for price. Um, I think having a, a low price game that is really feature rich is, um, is, is a great way to go. That's how we kind of learned, you know, as we went, uh, we would just do one game and you had a, a certain amount of time and you had, you felt kind of, um, uh, not so much guilty, but you had an obligation to really do as much as you can before, you know, they take away your game to get it to manufacturing uh, for the customer. Um, so I think um, I, I can't, I don't, my brain doesn't work, like how can I design a game, but take that part off and then charge the person more later to put that in. Um, it's just kind of anti uh, something, I don't know what, but, but definitely having a great um, uh, price point and having um, uh, you know, one selection, this is the game, this is the title, everybody on the Deep Root team has really worked hard to make this the best game you know, for you to purchase, I, I think that's a really good philosophy. Um, and definitely, you know, we'll, we'll, you'll see it in the games as they start to appear. Cost-driven or time-driven, would you say more? Neither are relevant. Yeah. Good, I'll give you kudos for good, you know, for trying, but uh, uh, we're, we're looking at everything very differently at Deep Root uh, than any other company, and we have the capital to do so. Um, and not trying to rub it in any other you know, company's face, but um, if we have that ability, why not use it um, for, for our benefit and yours? Excuse me. Hi, um, my question is going to be focused on um, distribution. So when you announce 2019, a lot of games coming available, what is the model for how will consumers purchase the games? Is, is your model a direct consumer base? Is it with distribute? standard distributors? Is it something different? And are you preparing for the tech support that will be needed for a lot of games, which is exciting, but we've seen other companies have, you know, issues and they're making sure that customers are going to be able to have issues, you know, work through when they receive those products? Um, I'll cover the tech support uh, question first, is we would prefer distributors not um, 
deal with our games. Um, we have a philosophy of making our games accessible to uh, even someone who can't even operate a remote. Uh, and we've put a lot of engineering into making that happen. Um, with that said, um, you know, pinball machines are complex and things do break down from time to time. And so we want, we're the best ones who know about our standard and what needs to be done. So it makes more sense to use modern technology um, and, and the ability we have to reach out to the customer, the customer reaching out to us and to help them with their problems quick and efficiently as possible, whereas a distributor might not have that, that benefit with such uh, very small margins. Uh, the other part of the question was about distribution. Um, there are some big talks uh, going on, and I don't want to um, I don't want to make any comments that might offend one over another, but uh, all of the above. Um, our games will be accessible, and uh, we would love um, for people who who connect with one or more of our games to to be able to purchase them. Uh, as easily uh, as possible, and to get it in their hands as quick as possible. I know, high, you know, Highway kind of ruined the two weeks quote um, before I even knew that was a quote. But um, our, our goal is still to be able to sell a game and get it to a customer in two weeks or less. You've asked a few of uh, you've put together an incredible all-star staff here. I'm wondering about. I'm going to ask Stephen and Barry, who've relocated. I mean, Stephen from New Jersey, giving up a career. Barry, you're missing all the great pasta here in the Midwest. What was it for you two that made you decide Deep Root was the company I'm going to relocate? Well, the number one thing was getting back into doing pinball full time again. And the weather's a lot better. I'm sick of Chicago weather. I spent my whole life here. <laughs> but yeah, I do miss the pizza and the pasta. But there's still a few places I get some decent stuff there. If not, I make my own. I'm half Italian, so I know how to cook. <laughs> yeah, the fact that 50 degrees is is, is cold. Uh, what? Okay, whatever. But <laughs> but uh, really, uh, yeah, really going down there and seeing what I saw. That's point blank. I'll just say that, and that's it. It's the, like I said, it's the best decision I've ever made. Thank you, guys. Yeah, go ahead, Dennis. Is this? Hell, I just wanted to add something to that as to why I went with Deep Root, and it's. After I met the people there, and uh, they have a lot of young, passionate, smart people, and Deep Root is going to make it, and we're going to surprise you with some cool stuff. And that's the main reason I went there, because I, I saw the passion in all of the people that are there. They've got a lot of smart engineers and programmers, and we're going to do cool stuff. Yeah, um, I was, I was. I really didn't know anything about Deep Root Pinball a year ago. I hadn't ever heard of them. And I've, I've always been, you know, one thing is when you're in pinball, you're, it's in your blood for the rest of your life. I, I'm sorry. You're, you may go off and do some other career, and it leave, you leave pinball, and yeah, you make money and generate income. And this is pinball. <laughs> this is pinball. That's that's why I'm here, and and I and it, it's great to be with people who are doing pinball because they love pinball, not just because it's a business that can that can produce black ink. That's why I'm here. Thank you, John. Want to be in interchangeable like let's like the, like the pinball 2000 series from from williams so you have one cabinet you can you can put uh, like for each new game you can just swap out a play field into it no there's not going to be any gimmicks in our in our uh, machines a uh, very interesting very tantalizing presentation uh, if I was a Deep Root customer, say, two years from now, and I bought my game on the secondary market, and I knew which end of the screwdriver went in the screw and which end of the soldering iron you hold, would I be able to fix the game, and would I be able to afford to fix the game? Uh, I'll answer the same way I did before, and maybe add just a, a little extra, is that um, we've spent a considerable... If all we had to do was just take what everyone else has done and spit out a pinball machine, uh, et cetera, whether it's you know, one of John's games or the other games, we would have already launched a long time ago. 
Uh, a lot of the magic that's happening behind the scenes is relooking at every uh, piece of the pinball machine and the pinball experience and redesigning it um, to, to create more value, to make it easier, um, doing a lot of cool things that have never been done or probably have never even thought of. And uh, I don't know about y'all, but I live, breathe pinball Despite running 17 other businesses, I, I live, breathe pinball 24/7. I can't get it out of my mind, and it's it's a curse. And uh, I know a lot of the people here, uh, and and back at the uh, the two offices that we have uh, have the same curse. And we're coming up with some of the craziest, zaniest things ever, and then making them reality. Um, so one of the focuses, directly to answer your question, is making that that pinball experience more inviting when it comes to diagnosing and then um, fixing uh, issues with the pinball machine. I would love to see our machines last 50 to 100 years, as, as some are, uh, that are even gracing these halls right now, uh, with minimal amount of, um, of repairs. Now, there's always going to be wear and tear items on every machine. It's just part of life. Um, but making those easier uh, to get in the future um, and, and standardizing them are, are, are one of the things that we've done. So, hey, And I, I would like, just real quick, can Patrick and Craig and Sean and, who, and Daniel here. Uh, these guys are doing magic. You stand up real quick, and then Daniel. I, I want to also recognize these, these guys. These guys are um, all mechanical engineers. We don't have any electricals here, unfortunately, but uh, these guys um, are rock stars. They knew nothing about pinball, but I think when you see what they've done uh, in March, I think these guys are going to be just as much a rock stars as these guys uh, up here. And um, there's a lot of really cool stuff coming, coming, uh, coming y'all's way. So thank y'all very much as well. Um, so. Um, Robert, you'd mentioned that, uh, just, just kind of follow up to the previous question, um, you'd said before something along the lines of you could take a sledgehammer to the play field, it's not going to break. Uh, what can you disclose? Is it going to be made of wood? Can you tell us now, or is this coming? Sean, can you stand up? No. Okay. So, so I just want to make sure we're going to take a sledgehammer to the play field, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay, right? I'm not saying I don't believe it. <laughs> I just yeah, define sledgehammer, right? De define substrate. So Sean, this is Sean's pet project, uh, and I know that he had a, he was quite surprised when I said sledgehammer. Uh, maybe it was a little hyperbole, maybe not. Um, but our play fields will be made out of uh, wood. There, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing, the problem with going a different substrate for the play field, it changes everything else about the gameplay and maintenance, and it introduces a whole lot of other problems. Uh, and that's why wood will probably for a long time uh, be the, the surface that, that pinball machine play fields will be made out of. Good question. I got a question the, about the electronics in the game. Are you designing your own boards, own circuit boards? Are they uh, surface mount technology or is it the old through hole? Um, who, is it somebody that is designing your boards in the pinball community or was it uh, a new entity? There's nothing novel about anything in pinball. Uh, pinball um, is basically just uh, a hunk and heap of a bunch of different parts that uh, many of them could be used in many other industries. So um, there's nothing special about having anyone in pinball design boards. Uh, and in fact, what I wanted to, to create a team w was, was with people outside of pinball when it came to that sort of stuff. Um, designing, a little different. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful to have the great pinball de legendary pinball designers uh, who I just want to say are not old and washed up and they only came to Duke Root for a paycheck. Uh, I see every day that these guys are passionate. Uh, they'd be here for free um, uh, if, if it really came to that, but it's, it doesn't, so we're good. So about boards, um, our electrical engineers, we have some amazing ones, Hosue and Matt are, are the main ones, and we have some, some techs. The reason why, when we talk about the five days of Deep Root, we will go through the entire process for, for that, and it'll be very entertaining uh, on where we started and where we ended up with all of our electrical system. I'll say this for now is that we will have our own boards. Um, there's not going to be anything crazy about them. It's going to be very simple um, for uh, the end user, whether they know anything about electronics or not, to maintain them uh, and upkeep them, and they're going to be very reliable. Uh, that's why we just um, 
uh, recently, as Jeff announced in his uh, Deep Root Tour, uh, we just put in an SMT line because we want to make sure that we have the best boards available for our pinball machines uh, and, and make sure that they're right the first time. So. This question is for Dennis Nordman. Are, are you going to do green water? Blue water? Red water? Dish water. Red water? Okay, just curious. And Barry, can you make another comic game? Hi, John. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I haven't had the pleasure to meet you yet, but uh, I appreciate that levity, uh, um, et cetera. So, all right. Yes. Are those, are those circuit boards going to have batteries that are going to piss all over the board and destroy it? <laughs> Considering uh, most of my Williams Bally at home require batteries still, and I haven't bothered to change them out for something uh, more reasonable uh, with modern tech, uh, no. Uh, I think most of what Deep Root was started on was me dealing with Williams Valley games and being pissed off about a lot of things, um, especially as a newcomer into pinball and, and not wanting to be an engineer all the time. And so uh, I think that what we've tried to do is, is resolve not only those old uh, issues, but even issues that haven't even been thought of yet uh, that need to be um, re-engineered and, and, and improved. Um, you asked specifically about manufacturing. I think uh, I'm, I'm not perfect in, in knowing it deeper it is. Uh, I think we face many of the same challenges every pinball startup has done. I think that I didn't anticipate the level of, of um, the level of taking on the Zidware um, um, process and, and taking care of those people, and we hope we've done a good job at, uh, of helping those who have wanted help. Um, I think from a manufacturing standpoint, um, I don't think we've underestimated anything yet, but we're going to have the same problems every new manufacturer has in getting a line up and going. We're going to have a lot of successes. We're going to have some challenges, and we're going to work through them. I think what's really um, helped us a lot is that we've been talking about them for the beginning from years. Um, and while it's a different thing in planning as best as you can to actually start manufacturing where, where still things are going to pop up that you can't even imagine or, or think of beforehand, uh, I think that uh, um, we've got some great talent uh, in our engineering and technician department. And uh, uh, come rain or shine, when we get to March, uh, people are going to be able to buy pinball machines from Deep Root and put them in their home. Well, um, thank you all very much um, for, for attending. Um, I know we've got another uh, seminar coming up, so we want to do that. I just want to go down the line real quick, and thank you all very much for coming on and, and sharing this uh, great journey by Deeper. And I'm going to give each one of you maybe, what, 30 seconds? And um, with any last thoughts, uh, if you have any, or, or maybe not. And we're going to try to make the best damn games we can, so... Come March, get ready to buy them. <laughs> um, just two quick things. Um, one, it's great to see uh, Rob Burke um, uh, have his show this year and get all his uh, ducks in a row and get everything's organized the way that um, he wants, wanted, and obviously to invite us to be part of it. So it's nice to uh, see that. And also, um, a small anecdote, uh, uh, Barry and I worked together at Williams for uh, seven or eight years. Um, never went to lunch. Uh, he'd go in his room, I'd go in my room. So it's been really a pleasure to work with him. Um, he's um, just an amazing designer. He's done a lot of games um, and a lot of innovation. And he's, you know, he's um, ready to go every morning and, and works very fast. And so it's real exciting to watch him work because I never got to watch him work. I got to watch Steve work a little bit, some of the other designers, but not Barry. So it's been a real treat for me to watch another designer kind of. Uh, ply his craft. Dennis won't show me anything. So. 
Uh, yeah, it's just it's just a really exciting journey to be to be a part of this whole thing, and and uh, you know I think a lot of us when we started we had some idea of what we thought we maybe were getting into, and and just to see it become even more amazing is is really is really awesome. It's just really really cool. So. Yeah, and I, I really love the opportunity to work with Deep Root Pinball and all of the talented people who are come from outside the pinball industry. I mean, Quinn, Quinn I, I, I work closely with Quinn on, on the, he's storyboarding the game, and he'll he'll throw an idea at me, and and you know, like I had I had most of the rule the rules set pretty well written for for the game, and then. And we need, oh, we, how would it, he, what if we work this into the game? And I'm like, yeah, that's really awesome. And it's like, I'm, I'm sitting home, home like four hours a night or four days to you get it into the game. And then I finally get to all my update, updated the storyboard and I'm all excited. And the game is, is like evolving and going. And that's just something, experience I've never, ever had a chance to do. And it's, it's really great. Yeah, I have uh, similar feelings. I'm I'm just thankful to Robert and Deep Root for allowing me to do two original themes, which is something I've wanted to do for years and years and years. So I'm really happy to be able to be doing that. Get ready. <laughs> thank thank you for levity there, Steve. Um, one last thing, no one asked about it, but I'll give y'all one more tidbit uh, for those of you who stayed to the end. Um, the uh, ad uh, is um, a very special game. Um, yeah, it's, it's a movie poster style that you might have seen in the uh, expo um, ad guide. And does anyone want to take a guess at what game they think that is going to be? Okay, we got a couple. Just shout it out real quick. Okay, what do you think? Is there someone else over here? Cosmic Chaos. Cosmic chaos. <laughs> okay, any other guesses? Okay, well, one of those was correct, so we'll leave it at that. Thank you all very much. <laughs>